And now it is my pleasure to introduce Peter Johnston, who will introduce our plenary speaker. Yeah, I'm truly honored to introduce our speaker, Dr. Judy Lysaker. <clears throat> I'm a longtime admirer of her work. Her work on uh, relationally oriented reading, dialogic transformation, and the development of relational capacity in children is seminal. Thoroughly grounded in dialogic theory and semiotics, she integrates research in developmental psychology, particularly moral and social development, along with implications for social justice. She brings both experimental and ethnographic sensibilities to posing and answering questions. She brings an ethnographer's and teacher's ability to listen to children and arrange for them to reveal their thinking. Her analytic strategies include statistics, linguistic analysis, and various qualitative methods, often in the same study. Judy's research reveals literacy to be a deeply human social practice and literacy teaching to be about the individual and collective development of human beings. Judy's a long-time contributing member of LRA. She is a thoroughly engaging speaker and genu a genuinely nice person. I'm excited to hear what she has prepared for us. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Judy Lysaker. Thank you, Peter, for that kind introduction, and to you, Gay, for inviting me to give this talk today. It's really a privilege to have this opportunity to talk with you about a relational perspective on literacy research, something that sort of consumed me for a while. Uh, I also want to thank my colleagues, some of you may be in this room who have contributed to my thinking, uh, both recently and over the years, and especially those whose work I'll draw upon today in this talk. I sincerely hope that something of what I have to say this afternoon will be of interest to you, to each of you, and add something to your LRA conference experience. Just a few opening comments to frame what I'll talk about today. This is the research integration talk of this year's conference, and you will see that I've tried to accept that challenge in the title and attempted to integrate ideas relevant to a relational perspective. Integration as a process has enormous benefit, which is probably why LRI decided to have such a talk as part of this conference. Taking time to integrate and when possible synthesizes ideas is useful in that it can result in pulling together pieces and creating some kind of coherent picture of something of interest. In this case, what a relational perspective might look like and what its possibilities are. But with integration, there is also the danger of losing particulars and the edges of definition of smaller ideas that contribute to the whole. This imposes some, Im some limitations, which I hope you will bear with. As you can see in the title, I'll be talking about a relational perspective. It's important to note that as I propose such a perspective, I am not suggesting this, this, that this view supplants others or should be regarded as standing alone or above other perspectives. Rather, I think a relational view answers some questions and provides a framework for understanding some important things about literacy and about reading and writing in particular. I hope my remarks today will be part of what Stentsenko calls a co-generative dialogue, one that engages us all in ideas for, the mutual for our mutual benefit and also the benefit of children, youth, teachers, and others that we serve. A relational perspective can mean many things. It could be said that lots of what most of us do is relational, so I think I'll draw a few boundaries. Today's talk will focus on res relational aspects of comprehending and composing specifically. I do this for a couple of reasons. First, I think there's an important and product there has been an important and productive focus on social interaction in classrooms through talk, critical work that some of you have done, and has pointed to the importance of these kinds of relationships for literacy learning. While less is known, I think, about the relatingness of comprehending and composing as meaning-making activities. Second, I think that considering comprehending and composing as relational is a new and promising area and something I feel pretty strongly about. So this means I won't be addressing some important areas of literacy learning that are critically important, like teacher-learner or peer relationships. Some are very close to my heart, except where they directly are, um, are implied in meaning-making with text. Finally, what I'll present today has, is concerned primarily with the reading and writing of narrative texts, though I do think that there is evidence to suggest that a relational perspective has the potential to shed light on meaning-making that occurs with informational texts as well an uh, area of research to be explored. 
Just a couple of stylistic notes. I'll be using some language that may be awkward and I'll probably trip over my words. My intent is not to add jargon to our talk, but to use language as a conceptual tool so that in shifting language, we can shift our focus so that meaning makings of text can be seen as experiences of doing rather than a thing. So I will use the words comprehending and composing to signal the doingness and the activity of these meaning making aspects. I will also be using the word relatingness to capture both the activity and the thingness of language as it occurs in written language. The second stylistic note about references and citations, I'll refer to many theorists and scholars throughout the talk. In the theoretical sections of the talk, I've chosen to use only names and not dates. I do this because in some cases I'm referring not just a single text to a body of work, and in the interest of consistency, I've chosen to forgo the use of dates. However, I have used dates for all empirical studies and will supply a full bibliograph, bibliograph information and references. So let's get started. As I mentioned, a relation, oh, let me just go back for a second. So this is what I'm setting out to do today. I want to talk about why we may need a relational perspective. And I'll draw on philosophy and psychology for that. Then I'll turn to literacy, literary, uh, and language theory um, to also outline the basis for a relational perspective. Then I will turn to empirical work for examples of relatingness in both comprehension, comprehending and composing, suggest some expansion of theory and of method. Finally, try to articulate a descriptive base and explanatory principles for a relational perspective. And close, of course, with some implications and questions. Oops. I'll get used to this clicker eventually. So as I mentioned, a relational perspective I see as not standing alone, but situated in sociocultural theory, specifically these ideas from sociocultural theory, that selves are dialogically constructed. This comes from Bakhtin's work, always transforming through language interactions, that inter and intramental activity are transformative, that we move from our social worlds to our uh, personal worlds, and that the relational simultane simultaneity an internalization of contrasting voices prompts transformations to become important as we move forward. Um, also that cells are, of course, historically and socially situated, and that we also are transformed by our use of symbols and tools. And that literate activity affords a, a promising way to contemplate our experiences because of the nature of written language. So I'm suggesting that um, what I will work on today is going to fit into this area here, te text-situated self-activities of relatingness that is situated in a larger um, sociocultural model that it also involves, as you can see here, the idea of identity and personhood as what is coming into being through these relatingness activities, and then the impact on self, world, and social justice and emancipation. So we have sort of embedded circles, but I don't think they're linear, and they certainly all affect each other. OK, so let's take a, a look at this slide. Um, this slide is, I'm not going to talk about everything on this slide. You'll be very relieved to know. This chart represents the breadth and depth of relational views of beingness across disciplines. This is a really fun area to hang out in if you have some extra time. Um, across time and traditions, human beings have been regarded as relational. And as Andrew Benjamin suggests, relational ontology is threaded through the history of philosophy um, for a long time now. And some, I, some areas of psychology and social constructivist psychology as well, as you can see by the list of authors and thinkers on this chart. The central assumption, if you're not familiar with relational ontology, according to philosopher Andrew Benjamin, is that the relation between things and not the things themselves constitute the basis of the structure of the world. So let's consider a few ideas from this body of work. There are several ways in which this relationality is articulated. Phenomenologists like Martin Heidegger posit that to be is to be in relation. It's a phenomenological given. Theologians like Martin Buber also suggest that it's our I-thou and I-it relationships that form our beingness. 
others from outside this continent, continental tradition, including uh, French philosopher Glissant in his work on French Caribbean realities argues that identity is and is extended through relation with others. And Winter's work who suggests that I am in relation to other and how the other sees me grounded in Du Bois. This idea will become important as we consider texts as addressing readers. Perhaps more closer to home is the idea that self is dialogic, that we are in relation as um, dialogic beings, a complex relation of self and other, that others constitute who we are at all times and across time spaces. Of course, this is echoed in Vygotsky's assertion that all knowing is instrumental first and then instrumental. And by Mead, who said the mind is the importation of social processes. So dialogism is seen as a quality of human beingness also in some aspects of psychology. In terms of psychology, the way that people talk about relatedness is through intersubjectivity. So intersubjective, intersubjective experience with others is ongoing. It's part of our humanness. It is a condition of who we are, and it's necessary for survival. So that we know with each other, that we are with each other as relational beings psychologically is also evidence of our relational beingness. Of course, this is not the end of our relational um, beingness because we not only are relational, but we know relationally. This is relational knowing has been purported by feminists for decades. Belenke and Kali's Woman's Way of Knowing started it off. Nancy Chardot's psychoanalytic, psychoanalytic Perspective and Carol Gilligan's work on moral development are examples of this relational epistemology. Um, the idea that meaning is a relationship between who we are and what we know is an, also an important idea. So meaning itself is relating. We can't get to meeting by, without relating to the world. Um, and that meaning always happens in dialogic relation with each other or with symbols. Our knowing originates and our human need for connection is mediated by relationships. Madeleine Gramey puts it this way, the world we notice is the one someone we cared about once noticed and pointed to. So as if this weren't enough, the neurobiologists have something to add. This slide just tells us that in terms of neurobiology, we're sort of wired for relation. Our brains and bodies function relationally, our systems communicate with each other, and our mirror neurons are set up so that what we see other people experience, we experience in our bodies as if we were seeing them, experiencing them. I want to suggest that this body of work has implications for what we might consider as meaningful and meaningfulness. It follows from these theoretical assertions about relationality of knowing and being that the meaning-making practices of reading writing should, would also be relational and meaningful because of it. What affords meaningfulness is the afford, excuse me, what is meaningful affords us the possibility of being in relation, allows us to make sense of that relational engagement, and gives us the opportunity to, to be immersed in the moral consequences and responsibilities of that relatingness. Well, clearly this body of work has implications for how we conceptualize reading and writing, Yet, most of our theoretical models of literacy undervalue or ignore relationality of the person reading and the relationality of reading and writing themselves. Undervaluing relationality positions us to neglect a thorough examination of these important aspects of comprehending and composing, how they are experienced and how they might, might be transformative. So I hope to show how a relational model can map some experiential terrain of comprehending and composing, as well as offer explanatory principles that may account for why anyone would want to read and write, as well how, why, how and why that engagement in reading and writing might be transformative. If you're me, it's kind of fun, to, sorry, to hang out in this conceptual world. Um, but you can't hang out there for too long because it seems to me that theories need to play out in useful ways in the real world. So you might have noticed, it's no surprise to any of us, that children and youth are facing some pressing relational challenges in terms of their socio-emotional development. 
I think these can be summarized in these two sets of challenges, challenges to under, have deep understandings of ourselves and value ourselves, and challenges to have deep understandings of others. Sounds simple. Just in case you needed this, and none of us do really, there are some rather dismal empirical evidence to go with this. But this slide suggests that there are pressing practical needs for some kind of relational perspective on our work. Um, I know I don't need to remind you that these needs are occurring in times of increasing social complexity, um, when there's a division among us nationally and globally, and in a time when hate speech is being normalized. A time, one could argue, in which non-simplistic understandings of self and other are urgently needed. I believe literacy can play a role, even if it's just a small one, in helping children and youth develop these kinds of understandings. So taken together, if we look at phil philosophy, psychology, and the current needs of our youth and children, we can see both theoretical and practical reasons for exploring the possibilities of a relational perspective. Beyond these considerations, however, we have literacy, literary, and language theory that supports such a perspective. So now I'll turn to that perspective, to a relational perspective in language, literacy, and literary theory. Another imposing slide. <laughs> this slide, like the previous one, is an attempt to show the breadth and depth of theoretical scholarship. I won't try to attend to all these ideas, but let me highlight a few things. Rosenblatt talks about a merger of the reader and the text that happens to such an extent that she considers the reader and the text to be convenient fictions. Schotter says something similar about writing in that it can involve a kind of withness in which writers get inside the living moment to write into and out of the micro details of spontaneous responsiveness. Consistent with this idea of merger and withness is dialogically oriented language theorists like Marie-Cécile Bertau, who describes meaning making as itself relational and an in-between. Not quite the reader and text in Rosenblatt's term, but something in, in composed in the middle, which is similar to the Bakhtinian idea that describes dialogue as composed of as an, the relationship between an utterance and reply. Moving to the literary theorists, who are not necessarily interested in phenomenology or the experience of relation, they turn to the importance of understanding characters in literary texts. So the, the people and the theorists in this area have an interest in using the idea of theory of mind to explain how it is that readers move in and out of text worlds. Popova seems to echo Rosenblatt's notion of a lived experience in her description of readers' relationships with characters as enact enacted during reading. This is consistent with others who view intersubjective relationships formed during spoken language events as embodied in enacted. Emotion is also theorized by Jensen as embodied and active and not separate but essential to language action. Cynthia Lewis and her colleagues have shown these ideas to be very important in classroom interactions. Integrating these ideas, I think we can put them together in meaningful ways. First, literacy events, including comprehending and composing, are lived experiences that are enacted and embodied. A merger and in-betweenness and withness comes into being through those activities of being in text and reading and writing. Movement within the text, moving between characters, is also something that is found in our theoretical ap approaches. Activity of self and text, where subjectivity, where intersubjectivity or sharedness is possible. So when we're actively involved in text, we become connected to characters. We have that sense of being with characters and a sense of the text and us becoming speaking, listening partners. This is an idea taken from Bertau. Text can be thought of as addressing readers, which fits with this idea of speaking, listening partners that comes right out of Bakhtin's theoretical work that views text and the idea of response and addressivity. 
Also, um, imagination seems critical here. Both Zatoun and Abby talk about imagination as critical to understanding other people and the establishment of intersubjectivity. If you think about this for a minute, we don't just automatically know what's happening with each other. There is some sort of imaginative leap that happens when we come to understand and know someone else. That's part of our language interactions, and I'm going to suggest that that also happens in comprehending and composing. And social understandings, which we also talk about in language interactions, that is the idea that we understand and know each other and our inner worlds and thoughts and feelings as critical to our relationships, also as part of language and literacy and literary theory, and I think can be applied to comprehending and composing. And finally, important of emotion being the fuel for our understandings of each other's, and uh, sorry, for, uh, emotion being the fuel for these relationships and, and a place in which they are embedded. Excuse me. So clearly we have resources for a relational perspective in language and literary theory. But this leaves us with a couple of questions. First, do these relationships that readers and writers have theoretically within, within text actually matter in terms of outcomes of reading and writing? A second, more complicated question is what does the relationality of reading and writing look like and what are the relationships of comprehending and composing? How are they experienced? Can we more specifically identify why these experiences of comprehending and composing can be transformative? So at these two of these questions I will turn now. First, let's take a look at outcomes. Does relatingness matter? And we have a set of studies that suggest it, it, it does, my own included, Ivy and Johnson's included, and some other important work from Com Comer, Kidd, and Castano, and another Johnson who suggests that relational activity and understanding of characters has a lot to do with how much we understand when we read texts. One of the interesting things about these outcomes is that the relatingness involved in understanding characters is linked to overall comprehending and not just the comprehending of characters. This makes sense in terms of Bruner's characterization of narrative as the intertwining of both landscapes of consciousness and action. And the way we need these but, and by the way, we need more studies on writing and outcomes. We don't have very much to speak of in terms of relatingness um, in composing, in terms of outcomes. So we know the readers' relationships with and within text matter for reading engagement and comprehending, but we're still left with the question: what do these relationships look like and how are they experienced? To answer these questions, I'll now turn to examples from empirical work that sheds light on the relationships enacted during reading and writing. As we look at these studies, please keep in mind that these scholar authors don't necessarily describe their own work in terms of a relational perspective, so these descriptions are my own. Also keep in mind that my purpose is not to present the studies or even to summarize them, but rather to use them to begin to lay out a topography of relatingness as it occurs in comprehending and composing. Also, in the interest of time, I won't discuss every slide. So the first set of studies we look at focuses on reading and writing with adolescents. Taking a look at this chart, we can see that in these studies and others like them, students put themselves within relationship to themselves. So in autobiographical writing, as has been studied by many people, the most prominent relationship is the self to the self. In both Fecko and Wisman's work, and from my reading of them, the purpose of the autobiographical writing that, is, that engages these students was, as Fecko himself puts it, existential. That is, students were writing to know and understand and imagine themselves, both in the present moment, understanding the past moments, and imagining future ones. An example of this comes from Wisman's work, in which she has adolescent girls being facing uncertainty, uncertainty of who they could be, who they are, who they might become. This writing was informed and mediated by their response to African American poetry and articulated in their writing. For these young women, reading and writing brought them into a new space of possibility. Wisman notes the importance of imagination, the use of metaphor to make this space possible. Students themselves in response to the adults around them using writing to see who they were and imagine who they could be and make themselves visible to each other, creating what Sugarman calls a space for self-interpretation. Participants in both these studies show awareness of the power of reading and writing as self and selfing experiences, 
as they experience themselves and their changes of themselves as they see themselves in text. Sorry, I said too many selves in that sentence. These descriptive accounts of relatingness within writing provide vivid portraits of being in text through writing and knowing self differently because of it. And like all the studies in this section, I hope you'll take a chance to, to look at them. Continuing with adolescence relational activity within, when te within text, I want to turn to two studies that purposely use writing as a tool for reading comprehension. Both studies by Beach and our Swedish colleagues use the rewriting of fictional narratives to reposition readers more concretely within text through voicing of characters. As you can see in this table, the primary relationships being enacted by students in these studies is the relationship between the reader, writer, and the text both the original text and the one coming into being. So these students are placed in the text through their rewriting of characters and then subsequently their, relation, their um, reflection on them. Let's take a look at this data. This is data from the Beach study and the students are, this is an assigned task, this is not a spontaneous task. The students are assigned to rewrite a narrative in order to develop their comprehending uh, abilities and my argument here is that as they enter the text as characters through writing they deepen their comprehension. As you can see in these data excerpts students whoops, excuse me. I want to make one methodological note here rewriting narratives and reflections on the collaborative writing of those narratives sets up multiple self positions from which students can re engage relationally. So they see them, they have relationships with characters, they have relationships with themselves within the text with characters, all of which create that simult simultaneity of difference leading to transformation. Staying with adolescent literacy and the relational activities of self involved in reading, I'd like to turn now to a set of studies by Ivy and Johnson. In this set of articles, reading on reading engagement and comprehension with a group of adolescents, teachers purposefully abandoned the usual curriculum in favor of students' selected self-paced reading. As you can see in this table, relationships with characters and with peers were the primary relationships that emerged as important in reading engagement and comprehension. By the way, this is really hard to say when the authors are sitting in the front row. Um, <laughs> because I could be wrong. What is important for the purposes of this talk is that the art, is articulating of several relationships involved in the engagement and, engagement and comprehending of these adolescents. Relationships with selves and with others were reported by students as students demonstrated changes in their perceptions of who they were and who they were becoming as a result of experience themselves as being in text. So here are some quotes from those studies. So it's like through the book, you could, in a way, always find yourself somewhere. So that's a relation of self to self, but self in text. The first books I've ever really gotten into, like these, you could really your picture yourself in that scene, another example of the same idea. The next one's interesting. Right now, she's having problems of her own. It's like I'm helping her with her problems as well as she's helping me. And they're talking about characters there. And then I had subconsciously put him in there. That's a student putting a real life person in the narrative, in the story. So these are all relationships that these students are having both in and outside of text. I think it's important to make a couple of methodological notes here. First, individual interviews are useful in setting up a particular kind of relationship for self-interpretation as when actually in the interview the students are re-narratizing their experience. So they not only had the experience of self and text, the experience of relating to characters, their experience of knowing themselves in relation to characters, which is slightly different, and then the experience of representing that through talk to a caring other. A second methodological note concerns the use of uh, Ivy and Johnson's use of third generation chat to link the transformation that they see in students through this reading and writing, through the, the reading engagement at a micro level to the larger activity of surrounding social structures in the classroom. I think this is one of the major challenges of a relational perspective in literacy research and is represented by those circles I showed you earlier in which this self-activity of relatingness is embedded in these larger structures.
So let's turn now to some um, other studies in the elementary area. I'll start this with Ann Dyson's work, well known to, I'm sure, everyone here as a pioneer in describing relationships in writing. As depicted in her title of her well-known book, The Social Worlds of Children Learning to Write. As you can see in Dyson's work, the self-to-peer relationship is the most important, and she calls the children as having spheres of relatedness. They present themselves in writing, they're eager to share it in order to form and maintain relationships. Though this is social outside of reading, or excuse me, social outside of reading, interestingly, Dyson calls it um, their purpose to manage their relationships. I think that's a really interesting phrase. But her work does highlight the ways in which children represent themselves in writing for the purpose of being with others. I also want to highlight Binder and I practice this name, Katsopolis, study of multimodal authoring. These young children made quilts as a primary self-activity, which was the expression of self within community. This is similar to Dyson's work in my mind, in that children's apparent purposes for literate activity was to say, here I am, will you be my friend? Unlike the relational activity of adolescence, um, and certainly consistent with the development of kindergartners' meaning making, the texts provide a material context for putting self in the world. In a different vein, there is a set of studies that examines writing, most often personal narratives, as a way to situate and resituate selves in multiple contexts, particularly in new cultural and linguistic contests faced by newcomers. Lehman and Van Sluis's work on writing functions as a in their work, writing functions as a means of putting self in relation to self as resituated to new and important others. An important addition in, in this work is Capello's idea that putting oneself in writing, it's not her idea, but that it represents voice, and that when we put ourselves in the world through voice, it gives us an opportunity then to relate to ourselves and to others in new ways. This is one of the few links I saw in the, the work that I did where um, the relational activity of writing was um, linked to what we might call uh, writing process or qualities of writing um, or outcomes for writing. The last study I want to mention today is Michael Muth's work. He worked with adults incarcerated fathers in prisons on multimodal projects. Um, they made murals together with their children, and he explored this as a, his interpretation of this was that those murals created a space for being in text for the children. So in other words, the children came together with their fathers, made murals, and it created a new place to be someone else, not just a prisoner, but a father, and a sense of caring for the children came, came with the being in the text. What's significant to me especially about this is the the idea of phenomenology here and the being in and being with and especially the being for text. The being in and being with text are ideas that I had encountered before, but being for is an, a new addition to me and I think an important one to think about um, the idea of relationality in this way. So taken as a whole, I think we can see, make some general statements about what we see in these studies in terms of the relatingness that's happening in comprehending and composing. We see self in relation to self across time spaces, self in relation to others across time spaces. We see um, both children and adolescents enacting relational purposes. We see that the activities of relatingness are important to outcomes in comprehending and composing, that students, both young and old, have a sense of moral agency when they're working within texts in relational ways, and that relational enactments constitute a both reading comprehension and engagement. We see a little less of that in writing, and fuel engagement and are linked to voice in writing. So let's just put these together on this um, summary slide. These are the relationships that we can see in comprehending and composing from these studies and empirical work, which I think, again, reflect some of the theoretical tenets we started with. Um, so we can see dialogism here quite clearly and the uh, idea of uh, the in-between or merger or transaction with text. There's self-to-text, 
There's self to self in text. I want to take a second to explain that. So if I am self, if I am interpreting text and I am in that text as the readers and writers we saw were, then their relationship within their self is now recontextualized as to be seen as a relationship occurring in that text. You see the difference there? It's slightly different, but I think super important. It happens through interpretation. Self to self with or self to self as character. We saw that in Beach's work and also in Ivy and Johnson's work. And of course, self to others. These are happening inside text, in storied worlds, in a narrative time and an actual time, and outside text, in real time and in real space. So we have a sort of description of what these relationships are, but there's still some questions, I think. One of those questions is how is this relating established? And how, did, in other words, how do these relationships come into being? How does this relatingness happen? And in addition to interviews and written products, what can we use as methodological, methodological tools that might help us to see this relatingness in more detail? So now I'm going to turn to expanding theory and empirical work, and I want to introduce just quickly some concepts which I'll illustrate in um, some of my own work. So here we are. Just to remind us, we're, we're talking about tech-situated self, activities of relatingness. So this is what I think readers and writers do to establish the relationships that we just saw from those empirical studies. First, there's something that I think they do, which is called response and recognition. In other words, this is very Bakhtinian. Response is that opening move towards text, the text world that occurs when readers perceive and apprehend symbolic representations. Something of the reader responds goes towards the addressivity of the text. These responses are not random, but as Linnell points out, are communicative actions specific to someone or something. And in this case, it's the communica communication between the subjectivities of the readers and those represented in the text, relatingness. Response is a way of becoming present to text, and we'll see that in a few minutes with a small child, um, a way that often involves recognition. So when we think about reading, sometimes it's really hard as adults who have been reading for a long time to back up from this, but when we read, what initially happens is that we have a response to that text. And we may not recognize ourselves I, um, in some sort of identical match-to-match, one-on-one way. I don't think that happens. But we recognize something in that text that reminds us of something in our own lives that provides the hook for us to go forward. Recontextualization, then, is the um, self-activity of putting oneself in the text. G talks about this a little bit in terms of recontextualizing all our experiences. What I want to suggest here that this is very complex idea, um, activity in which people who are reading have to sort of um, select and create this, uh, respond to the puzzle that is the text in them and figure out how to recontextualize experiences in a way that helps them make sense of text. It's a way of en enacting subjectivity in the text world. When this happens, that in-between is created. And then we have that experience of I with me and text and a, refra a refraction of self-experience. So once again, once self is landed in the text, I know this is like kind of esoteric sounding, then that ref refracts who I am so that I get a new view of myself, which I think leads to transformation. Once readers and writers find themselves in text, and I'm describing this as if it's ex extremely linear, and I don't think it is extremely, extremely linear. It's more recursive, but I think it makes more sense to talk about it this way and in a brief period of time. Once we are recontextualized in text, then the idea of social imagination can really come to the fore so that we begin to imagine, now that we've put ourselves in this text world, we start to imagine what this world is like, what the characters are like, what their realities are like, what their thoughts and feelings are like. In addition to that, we may also invent new narrative elements. And I think this is a really important part of what's missing from our comprehending theories. 
In other words, once we, this is often a result of recontextualization, so once I'm kind of hanging out in this text, I think if we think about our own reading of narratives, we probably do the same thing. Once we're kind of hanging out in that text world, we start filling in details. Somehow our own experiences just keep coming in there. We kind of change the plot a little bit or change the context or we refine the context or a plot based on our recontextualization of our own experience and invent new imaginative elements. The result of all this is a kind of intersubjectivity, and I'm using this as a, a different, slightly different term. I call it enacted intersubjectivity, in which I think that readers have a lived sense of experience within that text world, not just an understanding of one person's other mind, but more uh, an engagement in the realities of what that text world is like as a, a set of experiences involving lots of people and their relationships. So let me see if I can give you some exa examples of this extension of the theoretical framework that we started with from my own work. In most of my studies, I have to check the time, okay. In much of my recent work, I've used wordless book readings and most recently, illustration-based retellings as tools to make sense of the relatingness of comprehending. So I'm gonna be talking primarily about reading and reading with elementary school children as well as preschool children in this segment. As I, entered, as I give examples of these ideas of response, recognition, recontextualization, social imagination, and narrative imagination, I want to also show how we've used these three analytic tools to help get at those kind of nebulous concepts that I think are really helpful um, in understanding to see them as integral to comprehending and composing. The first will be microethnographic discourse analysis, which is based on Bloom et al.'s work. The second is a multimodal discourse analysis based on Norris's work. And the third, an analysis of dialogic intersubjectivity based on Gillespie and Cornish's work. And I think I don't go in that order, sorry. So let's look at the little kids first. I think sometimes it's really um, kind of, um, easier to see some of these relating activities in older kids who can really tell you about it, you know? Um, those adolescents uh, in Ivy and Johnson's work had a lot to say about what those relationships were like and what they meant to them. Um, and also in Beach's work, we could sort of see those kids becoming the characters and be able to reflect on it. So young kids um, relating is more difficult and harder to see. And we're looking at it in terms of multimodalities. So using wordless book reading, we've been listening to kids side by side, doing side by side wordless book reading. And here's a little picture of our friend Alice. And we look, we're looking at gaze as response, pointing as response, spoken narrative as both recognition and recontextualization, and sweeping as creating relationships with characters. So let me just say a minute about that as we look at Alice. What Alice did here was say the mommy and the girl are going to the beach. Now this is a wordless book. Um, she's completely making up the idea that that's a mommy and her little girl. And, I, and she uses the word her little girl. Whoops. Nope, the little girl, are going to the beach. So what she's suggesting there is that she's recontextual, what is suggested there to me is that she's recontextualizing her experience of adults and kids going to the beach and using a family um, that she is familiar with. Again, it's, sometimes it's really hard to go back here and talk about these very simple moves, but that's a move into the text world that's important. That's comprehending activity. The other thing that she does that's really interesting here and that's what the multimodal transcript does. It shows her fingers are going back and forth between the girl and the, and the mom in which she's enacting that relationship. So she doesn't say that that is um, her little girl, which is something we look for in some of these transcripts, but she says the mommy and a little girl, and she goes like this with her fingers. So here she has recontextual, she's responded through pointing, recontextualized her family experience, and now is creating relationships all through her body. It's really cool stuff to look at. I think we're ready for the Word document, Matteo, if you can. So secondly, I want to take a little bit of a look at the dialogical analysis of wordless book reading of kindergartners. And then this kind of analysis, um, what we do is we look at both the movement between characters, 
the, num the kind and number of relationships students are actually constructing as they're reading, um, as well as the intersubjective and uh, inter enacted intersubjectivity, which is the liveliness of this reader as he moves back and forth between the voices of text. Um, so analytically, this is really fun stuff because you can color code the movement of the voices. So when you see changes in color, that's this child moving between characters. That's prompted by social imagination. So he's able to go in between characters. And can you read any of that transcript? I know it's really tiny. Um, where he's saying, you know, come on, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. And then the sister answers and the mom comes in. So he's enacting all these relationships which you can easily see if you use this kind of um, uh, dialogic analysis. Otherwise, it just sounds like a really cool story, and it is a really cool story, and it should be appreciated as that. But I think it's much more than that. By the way, I think the naming of characters, again, because this is wordless book reading, excuse me, is a, um, a move of recontextualization. So she, he names the brother and the sister. He makes them have a relationship. Nowhere did anybody tell him this was a family with brothers and sisters. Again, I know that sounds simple, but that is a move of comprehending, and it's a relational move. I think we're done with that, Mateo. Thank you. Uh-oh, what did I do? Oops, now I really did it. This is another way that we um, kind of try to make a visual map of that same data. We find it really useful to make as many of these kinds of visual representations as possible, which I know many of you do in your own research. And we find that in mapping relationships, we get a sense of what we're calling relational density. Um, so we see here the relational density of James' reading. Those lines are for real. We looked at the relationships that James created, whether they were bi-directional, whether the mother regarded the father or the father regarded the mother, whether the boy talked to the girl or, regard, or the girl talked to the boy, and created that web of intersubjectivity, the web of relatingness in James' reading. Finally, I'll just talk a few minutes about the microethnographic discourse analysis that we've been using based on Bloom. The first thing I want to point out in this analysis is how we represented the data to start with, because I think this is really important in trying to analyzing, re, analyze relatingness and the possibility of this merger and in between as a place that we really need to get to if we're going to use a relational perspective. We created PowerPoint slides, as you can see, that have Woodson's text. This is the other side by Jacqueline Woodson. Um, we created PowerPoint slides that show Woodson's text, the illustration, as well as what the reader retold. Now, this is a retelling, so this fourth grader has already read the book, and now he is retelling it with the images in front of him, but not the words. So we call that image-aided retelling. In that way, we think we're getting a picture of this in-between. It's not quite just the boy reading. It's not quite the text. It's what he has constructed as the in-between, and in which he has shown us many of these um, self-activities of relating. So after we did this, we used um, dialogic, um, sorry, we used an adaptation of microethnographic discourse analysis along with integrated dialogic theory to see the reader as he displaces himself to take up other self-positions, first as character, um, and then as another character creating kind of a moral confrontation. So if we look at this data for a minute, um, he now is retelling this story, as I mentioned. And he reads, can you hear me if I do this? She was walking home when I woke up and she came back one more day to ask if she could play with me and my other friends. That, we think, is a, a moment of recontextualization that leads to narrative imagination. So nowhere in the book does anybody say anything about she's walking home and she was there when he woke up. But he understands, because he's already read the story, that that girl is still there. This is an ongoing relationship. And part of his comprehending of that, then, is to invent these new narrative elements. We could get into a long debate about whether or not these new narrative elements detract from comprehending. And I suppose there is a point at which they do. But what I'd like us to consider is that this narrative imagination is actually an important part of relating to the text and in making sense. The other thing I want to notice here is 
his dialogue. One of my other friends said no without even thinking about the question. It was kind of cruel, but I didn't have the guts to say anything. Now, you notice that's not quite the same as what Woodson says, who says, without even asking the rest of us. So we think that's an indication that that, that, that young boy reading this, by the way, he is using first person to speak the role of Clover, who is an African-American girl, and he is a white boy who lives in a nearly all-white rural community. So he has put himself in a position that he is pretty new to and is trying to figure out. So he says, instead of without asking the rest of us, without even thinking about the question. We think that's an instance of social imagination where he's imagining what might be going there and also imagining what might be in his mind at the same time. Again, putting himself in the text and creating a moral dilemma, which then he takes a moral stance on. I think it was kind of cruel and I didn't say anything. So all this is happening during reading. I really want to point that out. This is not discussing the reading. This is happening in retelling, which I think is another form of reading. And we see the potential here for having that simultaneity of contrasting voices that promotes and prompts transformation. By the way, both with um, James and John here, I think you can get a sense, I hope you can get a sense of this as lived experience. And if we had the video, you could, which I don't have permission to share, I would, um, you could really hear that in their voices. This really comes through as something that they are experiencing. I also want to make note of the role of emotion in this excerpt, for particularly the idea of trust. In some sense, John, in taking on this role of an African-American girl when he's a white boy and he's living in this rural white context is a real big moment of trust. He's trusting himself to go there and he's trusting that the text is a hospitable place, uh, a place where he can be, um, and that there's a uh, benefit from the risks of taking on these new selves and knowing himself differently. I think this is a really important idea that needs more investigation. The hospitality of text is an idea from, I think, Umberto um, Eco first. Um, is, is an important one, and I don't think it's as, as simple as let's line up some books with so, some kids. Um, the matching books to readers thing um, doesn't appeal to me even in this, this context. And I, I think as Ivy and Johnson pointed out, this is not a matter of finding books kids like. It's a matter of finding a place they can be and become. Oops. Microethnographic discourse analysis also helped us to see intertextuality as time-layered relatingness as readers bring themselves in text over time together to comprehend. In this slide, this is the very beginning of this retelling, John begins his retelling by creating a family for Annie. She's the white girl in the story, one of the main characters. Annie doesn't have a family in this story. I mean, she might have a family, but she's never referred to. We hope she has a family. Um, but it does, the family doesn't exist in Woodson's version. So it's another idea of recontextualization and narrative imagining that he decides, because he has already read the book, it's an, it's, he's, it's an intertextual connection, that he's taken up his experience of Anne Lee as friendly from his uh, experience of the conclusion of the story. Now he moves it into the beginning of this story. And it's delightful that he says, one summer we've just noticed there are some friendly neighbors across now let me tell you about it. And then he launches into his story. We think that narrative imagination helps him reconcile and build his comprehending across the time spaces of reading and retelling. So I'd like to note that in traditional retellings, this kind of imaginative move would be, might be considered outside text and likely undervalued as part of his unique comprehending activity. Finally, I just want to emphasize again the role of the text in these examples. As Rosenblatt has told us, there are no generic readers, there are no generic texts. Readers' ability to recognize and have the predilection to recontextualize happen in part as a function of the hospitality of texts, as I just mentioned. It's no um, new idea that we need more books where all children can find someone who, quote, looks like me. This is not new. But I think these principles of relatingness and comprehending accentuate its importance. I hope these examples provide the start to answering the question, what do readers do to establish relatingness, and how is it possible to study it? <laughs>
So I'd like to just sum up with trying to describe a descriptive base, meaning what does a relational perspective look like based on what we've seen, and how do we explain relatingness? If we just go back to seeing um, the relationships that we described earlier, remember this slide from earlier, the set of relationships that we were able to see from the studies and that they occur inside and outside text. Mateo, I think we're ready for that next slide. If we put this together in a more complex way, from right to left, we have the explanatory principles. So how does this relatingness happen? From those explanatory principles, we then see the set of relationships coming into being. Those sets of relationships might be considered to be in three relational domains, being in, being with, and being for. And I hope that you could see that in the data today and that that was clear to you. So in, in many of the studies, we saw the idea of being in text. We saw the idea of being with characters. And we saw the idea of being for other people, both for myself and autobiographical writing, for others in Ivy and Johnson's and Wisman's work, for others in the text and the work that we just saw um, from John. Whoops. Oh, I need that uh, slide again, Matteo. I wasn't done with it. I want to just note that um, I do see emotion, embodiment, and imagination on the bottom in blue as fueling all that and contextualizing that. It's as if we're immersed. We have to use imaginative and emotional activities in order to get to relatingness. I hope this makes sense in terms of um, just based on our own human experiences, right? Do we do any relating without being emotionally and imaginatively involved? A question to consider. And that this is always happening across text and time spaces. I think one of the limitations of my own work is that I have these individual texts that kids are in, and we need more studies where we can see kids in texts over time and over different kinds of texts. So if you need a research idea, there you go. The thing that's not represented to here, which is the super important point, is that all of this is what leads to the transformative experience of comprehending and composing, which is really in my view of it all is what it's all about. Okay, Matteo, thank you. So, some implications. First, for meaningfulness, which I think was the theme of the conference. We can see from these studies presented here today that participating in comprehending and composing, that these participants worked with comprehending and composing as ways of being. These activities provided them with opportunities to be who they were while becoming more than who they are. They, have oppor they had opportunities for making sense of their own relational engagements in the moment and over time, and to consider or enact the moral consequences of their relationality, expanding meaningfulness in their lives. So then, of course, this would mean consequences for students, enhanced well-being with the development of relational capacities, increased engagement in comprehending and composing, enhanced meaningfulness of their reading and writing, development of moral agency, and sensitivity to social justice. I think this is an inside-out approach to preparation for social justice, which I think is something that we really need. There are many implications for classrooms. I'll just go through them briefly, and you can talk to me later about them if you want to. I think we just will pay attention differently if we take a relational perspective and begin to value what kids are doing differently. That sounds sort of um, ambiguous, but I think super important. We know that our stances towards our students matter. Transformative experiences become outcomes. Um, what we're looking for, rather than just something nice that happens on the side. Oh, isn't it really great that that kid enjoyed that book? I do think individual languages and individual language learners are decentered when we look at relationship. I think this makes room for multilingualism. I think it makes room for kids that don't match our norms in the usual ways of assessing comprehension. We can think about pedagogy and environments differently as well. The availability of text, which we just talked about, 
Also, the notion of rereading becomes really important because it's relational revisiting and a, a way of deepening our understandings of ourselves and others, as well as the meaning of texts. And we can define comprehension and composing differently. Relational experiences become as important as background knowledge. Things like emotional involvement, imagination, can be seen as ways of being and vulnerability as ways of being that are necessary for comprehending and composing and not just, again, segregated from what we might view as just a cognitive experience. And I guess, finally, I think that becoming is achieving and that this transformative um, experience of relatingness is as important as anything else or more important than anything we could do in terms of kids being able to uh, pass tests and meet benchmarks. Just a few future directions for us all. There's a lot of work left to be done if we want to think about a, a relational perspective. Developing methodologies that go across time spaces that can account for sociocultural situatedness and even um, Geopolitical ideologies is really important and not yet done as far as I know. We need to find ways of mapping growth. And I think the multimodal analysis of density, complexity, intensity has some potential there. Examining the role of texts I mentioned, looking at variability and uh, how this relatingness looks across development is super important. We get a little bit of a picture of that here, but much more work needs to be done. And accounting for the experience of relational resistance, I'm sure you've seen it, I've seen it, where kids don't want to go. They don't want that. They don't have the trust. They don't want to do the risk taking. What is that about? What can we do as not as psychologists, but as literacy researchers? And of course, ways to disseminate this work, where people can take it seriously and not think it's just the soft stuff. There's some cautions. This is sort of dangerous territory. We're talking about human beings here. So we need to make sure that as stewards of a relational perspective, we ask some tough questions. What dangers are there in considering comprehending and composing as relatingness? And I think there could be some dangers, like homogenizing what becoming means. What are the new responsibilities that are incurred? And what research collaborations might we create that could mitigate against some of these dangers? I hope something that I've talked about today was of interest and might be useful to you as you consider relatingness as part of what makes reading and writing what it is. I just want to leave you with this definition that I've been working on. I won't read it to you. I'll let you read it to yourselves. And please, um, I would love to talk with any of you about a relational perspective of reading and writing, comprehending and composing, and how we might make it happen in our work. Thank you very much for your time and attention, and enjoy the rest of the conference.